السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Welcome again to another lecture on the topic of igniting your heart and your hearts. How do we revive the hearts right now? We are now one week into this blessed month. And inshallah ta'ala, we're tasting this beautiful month with its beautiful gifts. And of those gifts uh, is, is this uh, opportunity to reflect. Alhamdulillah, today in the sort of in building up from what we talked about yesterday, which was talking about how even by smiling and reintroducing the sunnah, this is an act of worship and it's also a, a beloved act to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we spoke about the power of smiling and how it absolutely encompasses people and enters their hearts. And it's a way in relaying a message and where people feel connected to you. And we spoke about the importance of how these things actually change your surroundings, both in your immediate environment with people that you know, and also to your neighbors and those who are not even Muslim. These are opportunities and golden opportunities that our beloved Prophet Muhammad wasallam taught us. So today, I want us to reflect about something that is now getting closer to the, you know, the topic at hand. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Fatir, بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما يستوي العمى والبصير ولا, ولا الظلمات ولا النور ولا, ولا الذل ولا الحرور وما يستوي الأحياء ولا الأموات صدق الله العظيم الله سبحانه وتعالى says the one uh, who is blind is not the same as the one who can see. And the one who is in darkness or darkness is not equal to light. Nor is shade the same as the, hard, the, the, the very hot and scorching heat. And nor is, is it the same, the one who, the, the, that which is alive and that which is dead. Today I'm talking about the state of the heart. And the heart here actually applies to all of these things that Allah mentions, mentions in Surah Al-Fatir. Where he is giving us this understanding that there are differences here. Between two states of people, two kinds of people, two personalities, two types of ways of life, ways of thinking, and two outcomes, not only in this world, but in the Akhirah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse, in Surah Al-Na'am, when He says, بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أو من كان ميتا فأحيينه وجعلنا له نور يمشي به في الناس كمن مثله في الظلمات ليس بخارج منها صدق الله العظيم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and then there are those that who are dead or that which is dead. And then Allah brings to that life. And then He makes of that nur, light, that a person can then walk with, live with, amongst being with people. And that person is, is not like the person who is living or is in darkness and that there is no escape from that darkness. This is the month of reviving the heart. This is igniting our hearts. How do we do so? This is what this topic is about today. Prophet ﷺ told us in a beautiful hadith uh, that is narrated by Abi uh, Musa عن, where the Prophet ﷺ said, مَثَلُ الَّذِي يَذْكُرُ رَبُّهُ وَالَّذِي لَا يَذْكُرُ رَبُّهُ مَثَلُ الْحَيِّ وَالْمَيِّتِ Where the Prophet ﷺ said that the, the person who is alive, or the person, sorry, who remembers Allah and remembers Him, and the one who does not remember Him, is, is in the likeness of the person who is alive and the one who is dead. How do we get this heart to be revived? 
Now, you know, we are often searching for this, that we come to Taraweeh, we pray, we fast, and during the day we're in and out of this khushu'ah. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it so much easier in the month of Ramadan for us to actually start feeling again. But there are things that we can do to start introducing ourselves to actually start benefiting it. And there are reasons why we have to understand why our hearts aren't feeling it. Now, when we are busy constantly doing wrong things, things that displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we actually start building, as the Prophet sallallahu said and narrated in another hadith, a black dot. And as that black dot actually seals the, the heart, no more is it possible for us, that is the eyes of the heart, to see outwards. The eyes of the heart actually are blinded. Hence, when we look for the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can't find it. It isn't that the khushu' of that, I mean the light of Allah has disappeared. The light of Allah is always there. Except the problem lies within us. The moment we start doing things that displease Allah, doing things that we harm other people, as the Prophet ﷺ said, that the person who says hard, hurtful words, lies, and then continues to spread these things and, and spreading harm to others through words, Allah is not in need of that person that who's left eating and, and drinking during the month of Ramadan. The whole idea is that this heart through our stopping of eating or abstaining from eating and the abstaining from drinking, that we start to see again. We start to feel again. Another way for us to sort of start this topic is when we look inside and reflect in our, what's in our heart, what is the first thing that we feel is, is actually in our heart? Put it another way. If you go into your heart right now, you close your eyes and you say, I want to know what is the, very mo the, the most important thing that lies in my heart. Whose name comes up? What item comes up? What place comes to, to your heart at that time? What reaches your tongue? If it's not Allah, and that's not the first thing that comes to your, your, when you think and you look in your heart, whose name comes first, then we have to do a check. We have to say, Am I now in that state where my heart's now covered and the light's not, I'm not able to see with the eyes of my heart. I'm actually blind. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a beautiful verse of Surah Al-Hajj where he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Have you not gone and left and traveled, meaning moving from one place to another? When it was Fasir of Al-Ard doesn't just mean traveling outside. It means when you leave, when you start leaving your environment, wherever that environment is, leaving your home, going to the masjid, going to a friend's house, going to the mall, getting out, just being out of your 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 sort of your, your typical space that you live in. أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْمِلُونَ بِهَا And isn't it that when you start changing your environment, where you, where you start leaving that place of comfort, do you not see from that, you know, that your heart start to work? They start to th it starts to think. It starts to reflect. And أَوْ عَذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا Or that the ears start to listen or your heart's not listening, or your heart's not working and reflecting and pondering and thinking of Allah. لا تعمل أبصار ولكن تعمل قلوب التي في الصدور It isn't that people's eyes are blinded. If it was based on that, all the Muslims, mashaAllah, if you look at the total population of Muslims and you look at how many people actually are, are people who have disabilities of the eyes, meaning that they're blind or they can't see, it's a very small portion. And even those people, Allah says, they're not the ones who are blind. The true ones, the true state of blindness is the one who can't see from here. And because as Allah says, it's the hearts that are, that are hiding within their chest that is blind. And that is the, the, is the most dangerous place to be, where we now can't see right from wrong. We can't see what's good from bad. We can't see that which brings goodness and benefit to myself and others. 
I don't see it. And this is why you talk to some people and you, you, you might ask them and you might say, you know what, you heard that individual. They say, I, I, I don't lose sleep over it. How do you not lose sleep over it? Subhanallah. How does one cheat somebody where they owe somebody money and their heart is so blinded that they say, no big deal. How is it that I can enter the masjid, for example, and talk to somebody right there and say, I, that person is like this. And remember, as Allah says, that the blindness is not in the blindness of these eyes. Because these eyes are actually a gift, a faculty that Allah gives to some and maybe does not give to others. But that does not abstain them from the sight of the eye. And this is al-basira. This is what we want. Ramadan is for what? Ramadan is to abstain our, our food, anything that enters our bodies, be it in, in, in drink or, or food. What for? If it's just for the idea of me feeling for my fellow human being outside, well then surely that might be one benefit. But for the Muslims, Shahr Ramadan is bigger than that. It is a month, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Shahr Ramadan al-ladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an hudallin nas. It's a guidance. This month is a guidance for us. Wal-bayyinati min al-huda wal-furqan. And it is a clear sign for us. For what? Guidance. What guides us to what? Guides us to what Allah is pleased with. Guides us to those things that, we're, that Allah is not pleased with. Put it in a different, more simpler way. It guides us to getting closer to Allah. And it guides us from, you know that detour sign that says, don't go there, you will go far away from Allah. He says, just, just follow that, man. I give the Qur'an, avoid the detour signs. Avoid the signs that say, no entrance allowed. Avoid the areas that say, bumpy roads ahead, take the other routes. That's al-huda wal-furqan. <laughs> al-furqan is not for... Allah doesn't need his makhluk. We are in need of the khaliq. We, Allah doesn't need his creation. When he says that al-furqan, al-furqan for what? Allah, does, Allah is the one who created us. He's not in need of telling any, any of his creation what is right, what is wrong. Allah is already the creator. He knows this. But because he loves us. He wants to have, to have the creation be happy in this world. So he says, listen... Do this and you'll be happy. Don't do this, you'll be sad. Follow the ways that I've shown you through the Prophet ﷺ and you will find solutions to your problems. You want to do it your way? Take the hard way. The criterion is there. So this is why we want to really, really reflect today about, okay, this is what I want. I want to, I want to start seeing with my eyes, the eyes of the heart. Now, the Prophet ﷺ when asked, where is... A taqwa, when he was asked, where's taqwa? He said, a taqwa hahuna. He said it three times. Taqwa is here. Taqwa is here. Taqwa is here. Why would the Prophet ﷺ, knowing full well that people will say, you know, that to have righteousness and being mindful of God is in what you do? Because re in reality, we are obsessed with how we look on the outside. We're obsessed. The easiest thing when somebody falls into this idea that I want to follow religion is they take the out, outward form. Very easy. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Right away people will, will wear hijab. and Right away the, the brothers will grow their beards. Right away all of a sudden in the Indo-Pak region we, a lot of the brothers will, will shorten their pants uh, you know, as their understanding of the sunnah. People will follow those things that are outward. And this is a beautiful thing. However, the outward has no meaning if it's not manifested with that which exists in their hearts. Meaning that their, their heart has to be cleansed from all of that blackness, the hujab, the hijab, of those, those veils that stop a person from seeing. And this is our big challenge. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنْظُرُوا the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah doesn't look at your outward appearances. He doesn't look at your wealth and your possessions. 
But he looks at what? He looks at your heart first. Again, even in this hadith, the, the mentioning is of the heart because this is the easiest to forget. Oh, but brother, I got I to gotta, I, I gotta do these things for the charity, the, the group that I'm working with. Okay, well, if you do the charity work, but you forgot why you're doing it and who you're doing it for, let me ask you, did we lose the, the, the mission? Or did we lose the point? There's that famous say, saying when we, when we say, keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the prize. The heart is that reminder. The prize is Allah. The prize is Jannah. The prize is, is being with the Prophet ﷺ. The prize is that I want to live in felicity and happiness for eternity. The prize is I follow this and I know Allah will be pleased with me. The prize is what? That Allah will accept me. The prize is that I get to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The prize is what? That after this crazy thing that we call life, which has ups and it has downs, it has days and periods of happiness, and some of us are shaqi in most of our lives. Allah decides this. Who stays happier, who stays sadder? All people are facing different challenges. But at the end of it, the promise that Allah gives all of His creation of humanity is follow my way, see with the eyes of your heart, let that purity manifest in the actions that you do and you will gain my pleasure and you will gain the pleasure in this dunya and you will get the pleasures, the eternal reward in the akhirah. Now, you know, when we look at, even when the Prophet Wasallam, when, when a sahaba said, you know, a matter comes to you and you're not sure what the best decision is, the Prophet Wasallam responded to the sahaba radiallahu anhu, istifti qalbak, yani, Seek contentment and, and counsel of your heart. Follow that which your heart is settled with. SubhanAllah. Of course you should ask people of knowledge that's upon everyone. فَسْلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرٍ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ So you can't just say, I feel like it, therefore it is. No, 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 no. <laughs> people will be all going all over me and saying that's wrong. Uh, but what, we're, what is being said is, is that make sure that you take counsel and check your heart. Now, we are, uh, we've been re- men- uh, recommended by some of the scholars to look at a few things here. Um, three things uh, that may help us understand if we're in a good position in our hearts this month of Ramadan. First, khashyatillah, bil ghayb. That I fear and I, f- I fear and I, uh, and I feel the presence of Allah even all in, in the in, in, in the, the ghayb, meaning that all of that which is that is unseen. So that is that I am always fearing Allah at all times. I'm in remembrance of Allah at all times. I'm mindful that Allah is with me all the time. Doesn't matter if I'm if I'm only uh, as they say the Ramadan Muslim. <laughs> Thirty days, mashaAllah. I'm Muslim and for eleven months I turn in my, Ramadan, my Muslim passport and I say, I don't want to be Muslim for 11 months. You know, this is a misunderstanding. The same Allah, the same Rabb of that Allah is, is in this month is the same Rabb of the, all, all of the years. So we have to remember khashyatillah bil ghayb. The next thing that we want to look at, uh, that, that as so long as Al-Khaliq, the creator, is pleased with you and pleased with me, we should not be affected at all. Yani la ubali. If the world, nobody is pleased with me. If by you making a decision, you know that Allah is pleased, but by doing so, you get the, the you get the attitude from people that you know, your friends, your family, and they'll say, you know what, you made the wrong decision, and you lost money, and you shouldn't have uh, left the relationship. You should have. Uh, you should have. Uh, not put the hijab on. You shouldn't have, uh, have, have told the people at work that you're not comfortable sitting around with people who drink. Um, these things, like, you might hear people around you, oh, that's not a good decision. You shouldn't have made that decision. And they might even start looking at you and saying, we are upset with your decision. Can you believe that? People will be upset at you making a decision that is better for you. But in their minds, they're looking at it and they're, Way They might be looking at it in terms of loss of money, loss of what they believe is valuable. But when you've done something and you know that this is in your right and Allah is, 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 is pleased with your decision, 
just by the fact that he gave us the permission to do something, then we should be saying, if all the world was to see me in a negative light, as long as my Allah is pleased with me, that's all that counts. This is another way to measure your heart and how, where you're at and your, 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 your faith and your ability to see. And the third thing is that if you lose something, that your iman doesn't change. So if you lose material wealth, your iman shouldn't go up and down. If your heart's that stable, you could say, these three things are my foundations of keeping me strong. So alhamdulillah, this is something I want you guys to think about. The things that we have to be very, it's, a, it's sort of that little, you know, that, that, that little meter that goes up and it gets to the red line and the red sort of zone. I want to tell you that red zone. And this is mentioned by the scholars. And it's interesting that these the scholars, uh, there's a book called Qut al Qulub, and it's a, an amazing book. Sheikh uh, Habib Omar uh, speaks about this in, in, in detail. But he speaks about the, the warning sign that each and every one of us has to have is when that line goes to that red zone. And what is that red zone? That red zone is when I start doing things based on what people are doing around me. So I come to the mosque and the masjid, and now I'm going to pray. So everybody says, MashaAllah, Shaykh, he's always in the front. Or so and so always comes to the mosque. Or look at, he has such khushu'. Or you know what, he's waiting for me, so I'm going to do an extra long ruku'. <laughs> you know? Or you, you want to be praised. Oh, you know what? I gave that sadaqah so that other people would notice that I gave sadaqah. The one who recites Qur'an. This is a warning, by the way, not just for the, the lay person that maybe knows little. This is even a, a greater warning for those who have knowledge. Because they're the ones that will think that by having the divine knowledge, you're protected. No. In fact, by having the more knowledge you have, the more accountable you'll be. The more knowledge you have of Allah, the divine laws that Allah has prescribed, the more you are at now a greater accountability. It's like with greater power that Allah gives in knowledge, the more responsibility. So I say to myself first, that Ya Rabb, Allah protect me from this state and protect all of us, yourselves especially when you're out there. Be aware, there was one man that was, he prayed in the masjid for many years and he got to the masjid and he started contemplating and he said, my goodness, every salah that I did all these years was because I wanted people to say, I pray in the front and I pray in the front first row. And he did this because that was his habit. What he did was he did tawbah, he, did, he asked Allah for forgiveness, and immediately he redid all of his salah. He repeated every single salah, farad, that he prayed. And he said because he was afraid that he did all of these things for people. And this is something that we want to be mindful of and this is what, inshallah ta'ala, we should be uh, mindful of. Imam al-Shafi'i rahmatullahi speaks about this as well. That the person that actually does their prayers and they do it because other people are watching and they're not for Allah, they've actually fallen in a state of kufr. This riyah that one pe- a per- a person falls into, the riyah, this is, this is where you want people to see you. And uh, we, we need to be careful about this as well. Now, inshallah ta'ala, really quickly as I want to tie some of these things in together, is how can we revive the heart in practical terms? Now we understand that the Qur'an describes the heart. It's been described in the Qur'an about 20 times directly, al-qalb. But mushtaqa, يعني, from its derivatives of this word of qalb, another 120 times. So uh, you're looking at 120, so 12 times, excuse me, directly with qalb, and 120 from the derivative of al-qalb. So 132 times in the Holy Quran. If that's not a, a something to put it in, in practical terms, how serious Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed the importance of the heart, and people want to dismiss it and say, no, 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 that might just be that fluffy stuff that people want to talk about. No, no, no. It is the, the the battleground that inshallah that will be our protection when we enter the questioning before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where when you say whatever is in this heart will be your shifa'a it will be your intercessor 
So what are some of the things that we should be doing in, in, in abundance? And I'm just going to be talking about some adhkar, doing some dhikr. Some of the things, that, the things I love and I want to share with you is finding things like saying astaghfirullah al-azim wa atubu ilayk. Astaghfirullah al-azim wa atubu ilayk. The people say it all the time, but it's such a beautiful thing. You know, when you and I do istighfar, when we ask Allah for forgiveness, we say, oh Allah, I ask you for forgiveness. Wa atubu ilayk. Huh? Wa atubu ilayk. You are actually turning yourself to Allah. What are you turning? Are you literally turning your body to Allah? Does Allah have a body? Hasha lillah. He doesn't have a body. So why are we saying, saying to Allah, I ask your forgiveness and I turn to you. What's turning to you, Ya Allah? It's this heart that was forgetful. It was this heart that was heedless. It was this heart that was, was distracted. We have to turn our hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Islam, and surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is what we're looking at when we're saying this, Astaghfirullah al-Azim wa atubu ilayk. So that's the first thing that I want to emphasize for all of us as well here. The other part of it is when we want to say La ilaha illallah. If you look at my mouth when I said La ilaha illallah, you cannot even see my lips move. Why? Because everything is found in the, 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 the tongue and the movement of the tongue and it's how it's said. You can't see La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah. Why? Because we should always be. This is a dhikr that you can do at all times. Why is it that we want to be mindful of this? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He, uh, the Prophet sallallahu shared with us that that person who, uh, who says, ma min abdin, qala la ilaha illallah, wa ma ta'ala thalika illa dakhal jannah. So, ma ta'ala thalika illa dakhal jannah, what the Prophet sallallahu said, there is not a servant uh, that, that is a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that says la ilaha illallah and they die saying that, believing it, living in that state and they died in that state. Illa dakhal al-jannah. You, this is our passport to jannah. This is the way that we, inshallah ta'ala we will enter jannah inshallah ta'ala. How much time have we got here? Um, like five more minutes. Five more minutes? Alright, so inshallah ta'ala. So this is the other thing. Get into the habit of saying La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah. In another beautiful hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was met from, from Sahaba, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. And they came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said that they were, these were the masakeen, these were the people who had little. So they came to the Rasulullah ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, these people who ha- or have more, who are, are rich, who have been endowed with more than us materially, they pray, we pray. And they, they strive in the way of Allah, we strive in the way of Allah. But Ya Rasulullah, they give in sadaqah, they give so much, they have so much money, they can sponsor a hundred people, a hundred orphans. They have so much that they can help the, the needy in some other land. They, there's so, uh, you know, so much abundance that they can uh, help build mosques and Islamic schools and whatnot. They can do all of this, but we don't have this. So Rasulullah Sallallahu smiled. And he said, shall I tell you something? That if you do, you can be of the same reward as they are. And you will be ahead of those that come after you, except if they follow what I tell you that, that, I'm gonna, that, that, you, that you should do. They said, Ya Rasulullah, tell us what that is. And he said, say after every salah, subhanallah ten times, alhamdulillah ten times, and Allahu Akbar ten times. And in other narrations, say it 33 times, Subhanallah, say Alhamdulillah 33 times and say Allahu Akbar 33 times and other narrations 34 times. And this just goes to show us that when we keep constant in our tongue being moist, as the Prophet said, when, he, when a Sahaba asked him, he said uh, that, uh, that the, the, uh, the burden of all the Islamic expectations upon me is so heavy. Can you tell me of something that is easier for me to do? And the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يزال لسانك رطباً من ذكر الله. He said, then in that case, keep your tongue moist in the constant remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
constant remembrance. Why will I give shaitan in my mind and in my heart a space and any invitation and I can stop those opportunities from shaitan entering my mind and my heart by constantly doing the zikr. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, astaghfirullah al-azim wa atubu alayk. Astaghfirullah al-azim wa atubu alayk. Ya Allah. And remember, why is istighfar, you know, the, one of the, the most powerful things you can do? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما كان الله معذبهم وهم يستغفرون that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, that Allah will not punish a people or send punishment to a people so long as they are constantly asking for his forgiveness so my invitation to each and every one of us myself first and everyone else afterwards is let us now start seeing with the eyes of the heart. Let us start checking ourselves, as I've shared with you, some of the gauges, some of the measurements, some of the self-check that we can do to see if we are getting closer to Allah or are we moving further away from Allah. And then by practically, through practical terms, cleansing the heart by constantly doing the dhikr. The dhikr, the adhkar. And you can follow the adhkar al-ma'thura, the, the adhkar that the Prophet has, has taught us. And there are many. But the ones that you should never leave is the tahleel, la ilaha illallah, the tasbih, the subhanallah, and praising Allah, the tahmeed, the hamd of Allah, the thana of Allah, the praising of Allah, alhamdulillah, and the takbir, and saying Allahu Akbar and glorifying Him in, in the greatest ways. And of course, istighfar, asking Allah for His forgiveness, and praising the Prophet Sallallahu sending salutations upon him and his family, and the companions and, his fa- and, and all of those who follow him. Keep this as your regular habit. But as the Prophet Sallallahu specified certain things, don't leave it. Don't leave it. These are gems. These are gems. Can you imagine that the angel of death is coming and your tongue is saying, La ilaha Allah, La ilaha Allah. Beautiful. Angel of death is coming, Allah, Allah. Shaitan wants to distract you, Allah, Allah. Subhanallah. Astaghfirullah. La ilaha Allah. Allahu Akbar. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is no power or might greater than that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I end with that. May Allah reward each and every one of you. Inshallah ta'ala. We have a question. Sure, go ahead. So this is from Instagram, from Room Noor. She says, this is a bit off topic, and I apologize for that. But I would like to know, my father is diabetic, and alhamdulillah he has been fasting. Is insulin by needle into the body break your fast? So the answer to that is no. The the yeah, so the question is, does using insulin, first of all, thank you so much, Sister Reem. May Allah bless you for joining us. And may Allah protect you and your family and accept your siyam and your, your, your righteous deeds during this blessed month. Uh, to answer the question, the question was, uh, does taking insulin, or in that case even a vaccine, break your fast? And the answer from the scholars uh, of the, who have done the study the matter, and the fatwa, is no, it does not break it. It doesn't break it for two primary reasons. First, there's nothing that's entering the mouth in the, in the form of food or drink. So that's one. Nothing is entering and, and passing your, your, your throat. So this would annul one's fast if one did this intentionally. And the other, ter- the other matter is, does it enter the stomach in any other way? I.e., does it somehow enter the stomach area? And it does not. It actually goes into the bloodstream and, and goes into other parts of the body and it does not actually enter the stomach. And for this reason, the scholars have said, stated that it does not break your fast, inshallah. Anything else? Uh, I want to thank everyone, inshallah ta'ala, for joining me today. And tomorrow we'll have another topic. Again, if you have any questions, if you have any thoughts, any comments, please keep it on uh, Facebook or the different uh, social media sort of uh, podiums and, and uh, and inshallah ta'ala, I can get to that as best as I can. We'll see you all tomorrow. Jazakallah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.